Okay, remember, they're changing my voice. Isaiah 27, the deliverance of Israel. In that day the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan the gliding serpent, Leviathan the coiling serpent, he will slay the monster of the sea. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. Okay, so I want to stop here for a second. In the parable of the tenants, right, it's about a vineyard. Okay, and it's also called the parable of the wicked husband. So Leviathan is a phallic symbol with implications on reproduction. It's like the devil gene is part of what they're saying in there. And with the sword of the spirit, right, and the, the design of the system, right? So if everyone, you know, believes that they're worshiping the devil and they, they throw their kid off a cliff or they turn their kid into an evil person with no way back, you know, the system itself that God made would have to played a part, right? So the Bible says wickedness burns like a fire. So insisting on reproducing with evil people, especially if they pretend to be good, okay, ruins these people and they're punished and they're heading off for eternal fire and they have pitiful lives when you really look at the cultures that are allowed i can't stress this enough because this is what people overlook in the bible almost more than anything is that their cultures themselves are pitiful their lives aren't worth living okay they're nerds they're jocks they're craftsmen without a higher cause okay so going to work you know what i'm saying and building a house by itself okay is not necessarily a bad thing okay but having no higher cause and just feed, you know contributing to the infrastructure of a country is rather pitiful you know imagine if you're you're you build houses in, in tanks in nazi germany right it's it's a sick pitiful life and then you go to hell so even the people we think of as, of as the hardest working perhaps at first glance you know construction workers you know sometimes their jobs are very very difficult they're out and you know the sun's beating down them okay if they don't obey god through me they're just mere craftsmen Okay, now think about it. people are more, we think of as more pitiful than that, like a nerd. A nerd is described as a foolish and contemptible person, boringly studious. So why are they doing all this studying for, like the tree of knowledge, just so they can serve the devil and contribute to their system after living a foolish and contemptible and boringly studious life? And in these days, there are lots of modern sex cults and stuff, and it's, it's pretty, pretty pathetic. You know, and of course, when they have their marriages are pathetic and so on and so forth, because they didn't man up. If you don't man up, you don't have a, a virtuous marriage. The reason why people, you know, are married with a priest, even though the priests worship the devil and so on and so forth, is the idea that you need a virtuous marriage to have a worthwhile marriage. So when you're just a foolish, contemptible, cowardly geek, okay, you know, your sex is foolish and contemptible and cowardly, that is the spirit that you're in. Your characteristics basically are the spirit that you're in. When you see them change my voice, this is not my characteristics that you're hearing. You know, if you listen carefully, you'll probably hear some something else there but you know it is the sabotage that's caused me to look this way no one looks at a black man who's 6'4 who looks like he, he could beat anyone's ass anywhere he goes okay and says hey that guy is some kind of geek you see what i'm saying he's in the nerd spirit they're trying to make it sound like that way and seem that way you know what i'm saying but i'm 6'4 200 pounds and i did martial arts for many years even now in this reduced state and forced to wear glasses i could easily outmaneuver somebody and 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 defeat them you see what i'm saying uh, except for on some days where they fume me extra heavily and that's a, you know, it caused me to limp and so on and so forth. Anyway, but you get the idea. All right, so where are we here? I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night. So let's just go ahead and start over again real quickly. In that day, the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I am angry. If only they were th there were th briars and thorns confronting me, I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire. Or else let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. Has the Lord struck her as he struck down those who struck her? Has she been killed as those were killed who killed her? By warfare and exile you contend with her. With his fierce blast he drives her out as on a day the east wind blows. By this then will Jacob's guilt be atoned for. And this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin when he makes 
All the altar stones be like the limestones crushed to pieces. No ash or poles or incense altars will be left standing. So it's not about, you know, these actual buildings, but yeah, that too. It's when, when he stops being an idolater, okay? When he obeys God through me, but I have to be here in the flesh. So this verse proves definitively that the Jews and everyone else can't go to heaven after I'm gone because it says you must atone for sin. You can't just say, you know, because remember Isaiah predicts Jesus will come. And so Jesus is operating within the parameters of Isaiah's prophecy when it's accurately interpreted by me, a man of God. Not some people in the church, they have all kinds of bad, you know, crazy interpretations. Okay, and it says right here in Isaiah 27, 9, by this then will Jacob's guilt be atoned for. And this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin. When he makes all the altar stones be like limestone crushed to pieces, no astral poles or incense altars will be left standing. Okay, so no, no, you know, Asherah is compared to Venus and Aphrodite, who's the mother of Eros, has to do with erotic desire, has to do with psychological construct, has to do with not living in reality. When he, when he starts being an idolater and lives in reality and accepts um, obeying God through me, okay, and after I'm gone, that can't be done, so people are blocked out of heaven, their, their offspring are as well. So 10, the fortified city stands desolate and abandoned settlement, forsaken like the wilderness. There calves graze, there they lie down. They strip its branches bare. When its twigs are dry, they are broken off. And when women come and make fires with them, excuse me, and women come and make fires with them. In that day, the Lord will thresh from the flowing Euphrates to the wadi of Egypt. And you, Israel, will be gathered up one by one. And in that day, a great trumpet will sound. And though those who were perishing... Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Now again, remember Galatians 4 makes it clear it's the mountain uh, in the sky. Okay, so those who worship the devil take this to mean the Jews, the Jewish di di uh, diaspora, the people who have the identity of Jews who self-identify as Jews, you know, will come together <clears throat> and, you know, they'll go, to, they'll go to Israel. But that's not what it's saying. Okay, it's saying that God is going to thresh the flesh and those who are in the divine order will go will pass over to the spiritual realm. And of course, this is what Paul says in his letters. He says that everyone will be gathered up into a cloud, okay, and will pass over. So this is the formula, okay. So even if, even if the, you you one is to argue, this is arguing about you know Israel being delivered from Babylon or Assyria, and you know Isaiah uh, will eventually go on to talk about the Assyrian king threatening Israel and so on and so forth. And, and uh, you know, the Old Testament ends in Babylonian captivity. Okay, it's a formula for uh, how you're delivered. And it has to have certain qualities. You know, righteousness and justice has to be part of the formula. Okay, so it's universal righteousness. So we look at the bigger picture. Is it okay for the Jews to keep doing evil, keep doing evil, and, and, and refusing to accept correction? Right, Proverbs says, you know, whoever uh, remains stiff-necked, after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed and in Acts Stephen calls them a stiff necked people who even killed Jesus the Messiah okay so not once we fast forward to modern day you know them as a people the spirit of the Jewish people remains stiff necked okay and they're they're going to go to hell after living lives that are not holy and so on and so forth okay that's what it's saying Okay, so the individuals need to obey God through me, but when they do, they leave that Jewish spirit because the kingdom of heaven is taken away from the Jews. So it's not a Jewish spirit. Okay, so when they say the root and offspring of David, it gets a little tricky because they don't mean David as a Jew in the story. They mean the idea in reality. Israel is Israel scrambled, and that's not a coincidence. Remember, Moses' names means to draw out. Jeshurun means the upright one. Jacob means to oversail, excuse me, to assail, overreach, to supplant, to follow, to circumvent. Right, these names literally mean something. That's why Jacob is called you worm, because Jacob, when his name is not Israel, for example, okay, you know, is somebody trying to cheat people, right? Like he cheated Esau and so on and so forth, and then the, you know he was punished for it and so on and so forth. But his offspring kept embracing that part of him as part of the story, and so they they didn't leave that worm. So it said Jacob, you worm, and a worm is archa archaic form for the snake. So the Jews that remain on the earth kind of, you know, uh, are said to attach themselves to the Gentiles who remain. So everyone who remains after him, God is evil, right? And to become this kind of world serpent, okay, this kind of worm that feeds on 
the flesh of the other people. So they're feeding on each other and they're feeding on the flesh of each other's offspring. And that has uh, spiritual uh, significance as well, right? They're feeding on the souls. They're rotting away together. They're feeding into uh, their mutual kind of uh, degradation and spiritual, you know, emptiness, bank morally, morally, mentally, romantically, and spiritually bankrupt uh, uh, lives. So Isaiah 28 says, Woe to the leaders of Ephraim and Judah. Remember, Isaiah 24 points out that the earth will be totally destroyed, never to rise again. Okay, it says, Woe to that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, to that city, the pride of those laid low by wine. See, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong, like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour. He will throw it forcefully to the ground. So you see, here in the next chapter, okay, it says that that God has as one who is mighty and strong, and He's going to spiritually throw uh, Ephraim's spirit uh, to the ground. Okay, so his his spiritual beauty is going to be thrown to the ground. And notice it says, the "Lord has one who is powerful and strong, spiritually powerful and strong, like a hailstorm." Going back to the clouds and the storm, and 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 Proverbs thirty-four, and a destructive wind. Right? See the, the storm, the destructive wind, like a driving rain and a downpour. He will throw it forcefully to the ground. So again, Isaiah twenty-eight two. Write that one down as well. It makes it clear that Proverbs thirty-four is referring to the top martial arts ever. Okay, it says, "What is his name? And what is his name of his son?" Surely you know. So who has the characteristics? Who is spiritually powerful and strong? Like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour, he will throw it first to the ground. Is it some European guy? So is it some European guy, okay, who is reading from the Bible, acting like he's doing something outside the divine order? No, it is only me. It could only possibly be me. So, you know, again, it says, that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, will be trampled underfoot, that fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, will be like figs ripe before harvest. As soon as people see them and take them in hand, they swallow them. In that day, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people, right? Those uh, in reality who obey God. And Jesus made that distinction too. He said his, his family are those who obey the commandments of God. That are, those are the people of God. He will be a spirit of justice to the, the one to the one who sits in judgment, a source of strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Proverbs 16, 10 through 12 shows that it's the one who's established the throne in righteousness and justice. That is me. Okay, focus more on intensity. The only person doing the right thing, everyone else cheating me out of my right to lead. So I'm the one who sits in judgment, and, and God is a source of strength. And, and to those in the spiritual realm, to me, turning back at the battle at the gate, cutting these people off from God and their offspring. The logic is sound, the wisdom is sound, my heart is in the right place, it's with God, and that is the divine verdict. And these also stagger from wine and reel from beer. Priests and prophets stagger from beer, and they are befuddled with wine. They reel from beer, they stagger when seeing vid uh, uh, visions, skimming. they stumble when rendering decisions. All the tables are covered with vomit, and there is not a spot without filth. Who is it he is trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? Is to children weaned from milk, to those just taken from the breast. For it is do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for, for that, a little here, a little there. Very well. With foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to these people, to whom he said, This is the resting place, let the weary rest, and this is the place of repose. But they would not listen. To whom he said, This is the resting place. Okay, uh, excuse me. They would not listen. So then the, the Lord of the Lord to them will become, Do this, do that, a little... Oh, excuse me, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. So that as they go, they will fall backwards, they will be injured and snared and captured. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem, you boast. We have entered into a covenant with death, with the realm of the dead. We have made an agreement. With an over, when an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us. For we have made a lie our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. Remember my explanation from early earlier okay where it says they made you know i said that they're not living in reality they're idolaters okay what does it mean to be an idolater to make a lie their refuge and falsehood their hiding place so again that's why you see the characteristics could only be me i'm the only one truly living in re reality because everyone else thinks that it's a good idea to cheat me out of my right to lead to the point where they're doing it or they don't even know who i am and they're just in some fantasy world of their own and fall in the corporate state or a hermit or whatever